Today's game is my number 10 best chess game of the 1990s, the little-known gem Alexander Passov versus the 11-year-old chess prodigy Jorge Samar Hasbun, previously known, known at the time as Jorge Zamora. Although you may not have heard of Samar Hasbun, he was a huge prodigy in the day as he became the youngest player ever to become a FIDE master and the youngest player at the time to defeat a grandmaster. In this game, we see scintillating and youthful play as he launches a magnificent king hunt that finishes in an incredible checkmate. Passov, the veteran player here, begins with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop c4, the Italian game. After knight f6 and knight g5, tapping the pawn here on f7, you really should know what to do. If you don't, then click on the card for my explanation of how to respond as black. Now, in this position, Samurai Hasbun does know the response, even without seeing my video. And now pawn takes d5, knight a5. The unintuitive knight leap to the edge of the board is the correct move. This hits the bishop over here, and the theoretical and important continuation is bishop b5 check when Trindy is after c6 to swap and go to the d3 square. In this line and in other variations in this line, you will see white win a pawn, but black will get a lot of really good piece activity. It's a very interesting and still theoretically hotly debated position. Instead, though, after knight a5, we get the move d3. Now, this is a bit of a dubious move. If your opponent plays this, you should say, yes, this is dubious. And now, after watching this video, I will know how to defeat this move. But in 1991, a dubious move like this was probably a little harder to exploit. Opening databases weren't really a thing yet, and chess engines were a thing, but they really sucked. Like, we would crush them sucked. So this was a situation in which you could play something a little dubious and your opponent would struggle a little bit more to find the refutation. After pawn d3, Samar Hasbun does know the antidote here. He plays pawn to h6, and whichever square the knight falls back to, we have the same problem. That is that this d3 pawn is trying to do double duty. It's trying to defend c4 and e4. Anytime you have that situation, you've got a problem. For example, knight e4, grab and grab, free piece. Also, after pawn to h6, if knight f3 as played in the game, black can continue to exploit this problem and does with the strong move pawn to e4. Again, if you take, uh, with pawn takes e4 here, then knight takes e4. Actually, this has been played before by David Bronstein nearly a world champion player, but I note that even though he won a brilliant game with this peace sacrifice, he never tried this against a grandmaster, and probably that's for good reason. In this game, we see Passov play the better move, queen to e2, and now Samar Hasbun plays the correct, knight takes c4, pawn takes, and bishop c5. Now white has won a pawn here, I like pawns, Yasser Serowan likes pawns, I'm sure you also like pawns, but in this position, black has a bishop pair, a really strong pawn on e4 is going to castle and generally have really good squares for his pieces, so this is a position where black has full compensation for the pawn, maybe even more than that. After bishop c5, the attack knight doesn't have to move, but it makes sense to pull back already with knight fd2, and that's what Passov does. In this position, Actually, Samar Hasbun misses the strongest move, and he misses the strongest move not just on this turn, but on the next three turns. The strongest move here was castles, and if white was foolhardy and tried to win the pawn on e4, then white actually loses the queen to one of the oldest tricks in the book, rook to e8, pinning and winning the queen on the e-file. I'm sure we've all been there at some point in our chess career. So, that was strong. Instead, though, he plays bishop g4, which is not strong because of pawn to f3. Unplayed, Passov missed this move. Now, I understand that you and I and Passov don't want to play pawn to f3, weakening these squares, making it very hard to castle. I know Ben Feingold has told us all, never play f3 or f6, but in this position, it's necessary. 
After the bishop pulls back, knight takes e4, creates big threats. And here, after knight takes, and then queen takes, and king f8, black does have compensation for even being two pawns down, but it's not enough compensation. White should be better. And this was definitely the best available continuation that white had. However, after bishop g4, Passov played queen to f1. This move certainly does not make a good impression, right? The queen is back on the starting rank, and it is also stopping white from castling. That should encourage us to look for a knockout blow, and there is one. Pause your video and see if you can find it. The strongest move is pawn to e3, ripping open the e-file, and after fe, bishop takes, a coming queen e7 should basically destroy white. This is a winning attack for the black player here. The king on e1 getting absolutely decimated. The extra pawn that white has is irrelevant. However, in this position, instead, after queen f1 of e3, we get castles. I love castling, but I don't love it as much as I loved the move e3. After castles, though, white again misses the strongest move. Knight b3 was that move, attacking this bishop and then controlling e3. Instead, we see a pawn move from white. White is going to make too many pawn moves in this game. h3. What's the best move? Once again, missed by Samar Hasboon. The move uh, pawn to e3 was really strong. Same idea. Even though the bishop is getting attacked here on g4, we can still push e3. After e3, fe, you can just pull your bishop back now, and even though you've lost another pawn here, you still have amazing attacking potential. For example, knight f3, knight to e4 is huge. Look at all these pieces, and black's attack on the e-file with the rook and queens coming in is going to be monstrous. Instead, though, after h3, the bishop pulled back to h5. Knight b3 now. Finally, white is getting to uncoil. The bishop falls back to e7. Stronger was throwing in bishop b4 check and then going to e7. Bishop b3 now. And now in this position, white is getting close to consolidating, right? We just need knight c3, and maybe we throw in the move g4, queen e2, castles. Some ideas like this could certainly get us to a safe position. We might even have all of our pawns without allowing counterplay. That means that black must act now. Samur Hasbun does so. He plays pawn to b5. The idea is, of course, to tear out the supports for d5. If d5 falls, then black's knight can finally get into the game, and the queen is obviously starting to open up her potential. After b5, the strongest move was knight c3, developing and supporting d5. This is a very unclear position, but white has good chances for an advantage after Samar Hasboon has missed his three strong continuations earlier in the game. This is not played, though. I already told you that we're going to see too many pawn moves from white. g4 is another mistaken pawn move, asking the bishop to fall back, and then maybe we can bring out the knight. But that bishop is not going to fall back. When, you're, when your opponent's king is stuck in the middle of the board, you should push forward. Be willing to sacrifice material to open those lines and get at the king. That's exactly what Samar Hasbun does. It is absolutely correct. After pawn g4, we get pawn takes c4, attacking this knight, so the queen recaptures, and now knight takes d5. Boom! A very strong sacrifice. This sacrifice gives up this bishop on h5 to open lines and get to the king on e1. Now, from here on to the end of the game, there will be one and only one opportunity for Passov to save this game. After knight takes d5, pawn takes h5, knight takes e3, fe3, bishop h4, check. Notice that you can't go king f1 because of a forced mate here. The queen snakes her way into f2. Therefore, the king goes to e2 after bishop h4 check, and now queen g5. The queen is threatening to go to g2 check and pick up the rook on h1. The queen is also eyeing this pawn here on h5, and of course the rooks are thinking about introducing themselves into the discussion regarding whether or not the white king is going to get checkmated. After queen g5, this is that one moment that Passov could have saved the game. 
Pause your video and see if you can find an amazing computer move. The only opportunity that White had to save the game was king to d1. Just saying, I'm leaving, I hate this party, I'm out, right? I'm going to take my toys and go to c1 and you can't checkmate me anymore. In fact, after queen takes e3, Black does have good compensation still. In fact, practically, I think I'd still rather be playing the black pieces, but this is not a position where there is a knockout blow for black. This is a position that is very much hotly contested. White has managed to evade the king hunt. In the game, though, after queen g5, Passov very understandably misses this king d1 move. If you play king d1, I'd be like, wow, you might be using a computer, right? You know, except that computers weren't any good at this point. But I'd still be like, hey, I'm suspicious. How did you find an amazing move like king d1? Queen takes e4 is played. Like every move that is not king d1, this is a losing move. But you still need some great moves to punish it. So the obvious natural and strong thing here is to introduce a rook into the uh, play on the e-file. The question is which rook? Now, actually, both rooks are strong, but for different reasons. Rook f8 was the stronger rook option. After queen f3, you need a quiet move, rook a d8. This is very, very nice. After rook a d8, you have two huge threats. One is rook takes e3, which is a beautiful sacrifice that forces mate after queen takes and queen g2. The other is queen b5, and together these two threats are crushing. Black is just winning in this position. However, this wasn't played by Samur Hasboon. After queen takes e4, he played rook a e8, probably wanting to make sure that his rook wasn't hanging on a8 in any line to the queen. This still wins, but he's going to have to be more precise. After rook a e8, queen f3, pause your video, and see if you can begin this beautiful king hunt. The correct move played by Samar Hasboon is rook takes e3 check. Boom! A really wonderful rook sacrifice that allows the queen to check the white king across the d file and into the queen side where it's eventually going to be checkmated. After rook takes e3, queen takes is of course forced, queen g2 check. Now the king is driven to the d file. Obviously d1 is unappealing because you're losing the rook with check. And if you go to d2, you even lose the queen to a pin here with bishop g5. So the king runs up the board, king d3. Of course, this invites rook to d8 check. And in this position, white finally has some choice, but the choices are not good. If knight d4, then queen takes h1 is really strong. You're dealing with huge threats to just win the piece back and continue with that attack, and you cannot uncoil here. The queen side pieces are unable to develop, so this is a winning position for black despite being the piece down. Better seems to be king c3, but again, you can just play queen takes h1. And in this position, even though because this rook is now defended, you can move your knight to d2 or to a3, Black's attack after bishop f6 and then bringing the queen back is winning. The rook on a1 plays no part and the king has no protection. He is hunted down by the black pieces. So after rook to d8 check, white actually tried king up to c4. This loses in the most spectacular fashion. Queen to d5 check. Obviously, if you go back, then bishop f6 is a strong inclusion. So the king goes to b4, trying to find safety over here on the a file. Rook to b8 check, king to a3. And in this position, there are multiple strong and winning moves because the white king doesn't really have any opportunity to get safe in the long run. But I want you to pause your video and find the beautiful force checkmate actually played by Samur Hasboon in the game. So first off, a false path. Rook takes b3. And then if the pawns take, queen to a5 is checkmate. Gorgeous. But if queen takes b3, we do not have a forced checkmate. 
Therefore, in this position, the correct move is bishop to e7 check, which is going to sacrifice the bishop to decoy the queen to e7. Queen takes e7, and now rook takes b3. Boom! And this forces resignation. It's mate next move, whether the a pawn or the c pawn takes, or if the king runs up and allows queen to b5. What a beautiful finish here with the lone black queen finishing off the king. This is, to my mind, the best game by a player of this age in chess history. Again, only 11 years old, Samer Hasboon concludes an amazing king hunt. If you want to see more incredible games from the 1990s and the 2000s, then simply click on the playlist on top of the chessboard.